At this point, we are officially moving into the Plato unit, which is a very big deal because Plato, well, a modern philosopher, uh, modern, I mean very modern, 1900s, Al uh, Alfred Whitehead, I think was his name, he said, the whole history of Western philosophy has been nothing but a series of footnotes on Plato. And he's right. Whether agreeing or disagreeing, almost everything that's been said in the last 2,500 years in philosophy has some, in some way, shape, or form taken its inspiration from something in these pages right here. This is all of Plato's works. Um, so I don't know if this is, if the size surprises you due to its thickness or lack thereof, but, uh, and yeah, it's a lot of stuff in here, but it's really not that much. I mean, your average middle schooler has probably put more on social media by the time they're like 12 than Plato put in these pages here. So, and I think that Plato had slightly more important things to say, so, so we can forgive him for writing this amount. And of course, there's this t the quintessential dilemma, the problem of Socrates, what was what Socrates said and what was what Plato put in his mouth. And I don't really care, and I don't think too many people do outside of certain academic circles. But I, I have this point be our move into the Plato unit, because what you're going to read for next Monday, Phaedo, and by the way, this is heavily abridged. If you just look up Phaedo online, you'll read four times as much as you have to. Uh, you're going to be introduced in this dialogue. Yes, we're, yes, it's chronological. This is the very next dialogue after Crito. It's his last words. But uh, what you're going to be introduced to in this dialogue is Plato's most important theory, his most important teaching, his most important doctrine. And for the rest of today's class, all I want to do is introduce that teaching, that theory of Plato's, which he is most famous for, and which he introduces perhaps for the first time in the Phaedo dialogue. And I say he introduces, obviously, by merely saying that, I am implying that Plato did inject some of his own philosophizing into this dialogue, and it was perhaps a little more than just a recounting of what Socrates said in his last moments, and yes, I'll grant that. He seems to imply that in the beginning. We'll get to that next week. But, um, but anyway, I want to have this discussion before you guys read it. I assume most of you haven't read it yet. So that one of the most important arguments Socrates slash Plato makes in that dialogue will make a little more sense. So, so uh, because he, in that argument, he uses this most important theory. And what he means by it is not exactly clear in that dialogue, but I hope to introduce you to it right now. And it's quite a task. I'm doing something that most philosophy teachers would probably say is imprudent. I am diving into the Plato unit by immediately uh, diving into his deepest, most important, and yet most abstract teaching of all. But it's... Uh, I don't see why to not try. All right, but before we do that, let me do my usual. Read a couple pages, a couple paragraphs from Copleston. Our friend Frederick Copleston here, introducing Plato. Points out that he was born in probably 428 or 427 BC, so he was about 28, 29 years old when Socrates was killed. And he points, the next significant thing he says here, in my opinion, is during the later course of the Peloponnesian War, it's highly probable that Plato fought there, it can hardly have failed to strike Plato that the democracy lacked a truly capable and responsible leader, and what leaders there were were easily spoiled by the necessity of pleasing the populace. Plato's final abstention from home politics no doubt dates from the trial and condemnation of his master. Why am I all of a sudden talking about politics? Well, you'll see in a moment why this is relevant. But the formulation of his conviction that the ship of state needs a firm pilot to guide her, and that he must be one who knows the right course to follow, and who is prepared to act conscientiously in accordance with that knowledge, can hardly fail to have been laid during the years when Athenian power was passing to its eclipse. His relatives in the oligarchy urged Plato to enter upon a political life under their patronage. 
that when the oligarchy started to pursue a policy of violence and attempted to implicate Socrates in their crimes, Plato became disgusted with them. Yet the Democrats were no better, those who advocated for democracy, that is, or those who were in the Athenian democracy, since it was they who put Socrates to death, and Plato accordingly abandoned the idea of a political career. All right. So it seems weird for me to start with that, but why is it even brought up? You know, usually in the biography of a modern philosopher, they don't usually have a bunch of paragraphs explaining why this philosopher wasn't in politics. Well, it was always expected. It was expected then that if you were to, going to dedicate yourself to philosophizing, which is essentially trying your absolute best to discover what the good is, what it consists in, how to achieve it, how to live in accordance with it. It was only natural that this knowledge would be applied to the betterment of society as a whole, namely in politics. It was, there was not this artificial divide between the personal good and the common good. There was just the good. And there was the notion that all of society ought to be directed towards that good as best as we can possibly direct it. So yes, it was natural to be in politics as a philosopher. Not exactly the case today. Um, points out here, there are some hints as to Plato's political views. He is famously anti-what? That we are very pro today, usually. Democracy. He hated democracy. And you can still love Plato and democracy at the same time, but we're going to hopefully get time next week or after, although my goodness, we're running up to the end of the course here. We only have two weeks left after today. So hopefully next week we'll get some time to look at the Republic, where he gives some of his political teachings. And I think you'll find incredible wisdom in there as well. And even if you don't agree with him on hating democracy, which we probably shouldn't agree with him on, um, he still has some very good points to make in that regard. And it's important that we understand his, his teaching on philosopher kings, which is a famous teaching of his as well. Anyway, more on that next week. The next thing here that Copleston says is more important to remember about Plato, actually. On his return to Athens, he had left for a time, Plato founded the Academy. Academy has become just a general title for any learning institution today, but it is actually the proper name of the school that Plato himself started, the Academy. The Academy may rightly be called the first European university, for the studies were not confined to philosophy, but extended over a wide range of auxiliary sciences like mathematics, astronomy, physical sciences, the members of the school joining in the common worship of the muses. Youths came to the Academy not only from Athens itself, but also from abroad. So this Academy was a school, yes, but it was more than a school. It was, it was close, more closely related to um, a religious order, in fact. There was this whole common life. It was not just learning some facts together a few hours a week like most schools are. It was this real uh, deep union of the students, not just academically, but even spiritually. And Copleston points out here that the um, Besides directing the studies in the academy, Plato himself gave lectures, and his hearers took notes. It is important to notice that these lectures were not published, and that they stand in contrast to the dialogues, which were published works, meant for, quote, popular reading. So all this stuff, this is everything that we have from Plato. Almost the entirety of it is the dialogues the Socratic dialogue. Socrates is the character of almost everything that Plato wrote. The only other thing we have from Plato is a few letters that he wrote to people. Um, he gave lectures where he directly expressed his philosophical teachings, but he demanded that they not be published. He wouldn't allow them to be published, and we don't have any of the notes that any of his students took. This, he believed, was the way, and the only way, to uh, introduce people in general to these teachings that it would be artificial, in his, mind, in his view, to just directly expose people to the exposition of the teachings themselves. Instead, it had to be part of the dialogue in Plato's mind. Let's see what he says on that. In one of his letters, in letter seven, he says this. 
So there is not and may there never be any treatise by me, at least on these things, these philosophical teachings. For the subject is not communicable in words, as the other sciences are. Rather, is it, it is that after a long association in the business itself and a shared life, that a light is lit in the soul, kindled as it were by a leaping flame, and thenceforward feeds itself. Therefore, I have never myself written a word on these matters, and there neither is nor ever shall be any written treatise of Plato. What now bears the name belongs to Socrates, beautified and rejuvenated. Plato is insisting that these teachings are not simply facts to be memorized, that it is something that is lit in the soul. And this cannot be taught. Remember, it cannot be directly communicated to anybody else. Other people can only be introduced to it. And then it's up to them whether or not to feed that flame. But this can only happen in person. One of the reasons I require attendance, so you can thank Plato for that. Uh, I take inspiration from his views here that this has to be done in common. That it's not dry data to simply be memorized. There's plenty of people out there who propose themselves as wise because they've got all the data memorized and they're complete fools. Probably because they haven't dialogued enough with other real human beings. Probably spent a lot of time on their computers or something. Anyway, there's our introduction to Plato. Plato, we're going to talk about this image shortly. A lot of you have probably seen this before. It's a very famous painting. Uh, it does not have the red circle on it in real life. I, I made that on my computer and accidentally saved it and I haven't gotten around to replacing the image, so we're going to talk about that red shape that I drew there shortly. It's kind of important. It's actually the most important part of the picture. Maybe I should go paint it on the original in the uh, Apostolic Palace in the Vatican, but maybe I won't. Anyway, before we get to this picture, let's dive directly in to Plato's most important theory, as I promised by way of a cute, ridiculous little eight-minute video that a student sent me a few years ago. But I like it. And it's the allegory of the cave. Plato's most famous allegory. Some of you may have heard of it already. But it's a good way for us to begin talking about his most important theory, the forms. And here's a discussion sheet. Oh, thank you. problem. Thank you. Now, although this video is a bit cheesy in terms of its animation, the narration is taken directly from Plato's work from the Republic. So it's quality uh, content in here. Just one sec.
fire is blazing in the distance. They see only their own shadows, which the fire throws on the opposite wall. But how could they see anything but the shadows if they were never allowed to move their heads? Between the fire and the prisoners, there is a raised way and a low wall built along the way like the screen which puppet players have in front of them over which they show the puppets. Do you see men passing along the wall carrying all sorts of articles which they hold projected above the wall? Statues of men and animals made of wood and stone and various materials? Of the objects which are being carried in like men they would only see the shadows. And if they were able to converse with one another, would they not suppose that they were naming what was actually before them? <coughs> and suppose further that there was an echo which came from the wall. Would they not be sure to think when one of the passers-by spoke that the voice came from the passing shadows? To them, the truth would be literally nothing but the shadows of the images. And now look again and see what will naturally follow if one of the prisoners is released. At first, when he is liberated and compelled suddenly to stand up and turn his head round and look towards the light, all this would hurt him and he would be much too dazzled to see distinctly those things whose shadows he'd seen before. And then conceive someone saying to him that what he saw before was an illusion. But that now, when he's approaching nearer to reality, his eyes turn toward more real existence. He has a clearer vision. What will be his reply? And you can further imagine that his instructor is pointing to the objects as they pass and requiring him to name them. Will he not be perplexed? Will he not think that the shadows which he formerly saw are truer than the objects which are not shown to him. And suppose once more that he is reluctantly dragged up a steep and rugged ascent and held fast until he is forced into the presence of the sun himself. When he approaches the light, his eyes will be dazzled and he will not be able to see anything at all of what are now called reality. He will require to grow accustomed to the sight of the upper world. And first he will see the shadows best. Next the reflections of objects in the water, and then the objects themselves. Then he will gaze upon the stars and the spangled heavens, and the light of the moon. He will see the sky and the stars by night. Last of all, he will be able to see the sun. And not mere reflections of it in the water, but he will see the sun in its own proper place and not in another. And he will contemplate the sun as it is. Would he not then proceed to argue that it is the sun who gives the season and the years, and is the guardian of all that is in the visible world? and in a certain way the cause of all things which his fellows have been accustomed to behold. Clearly he would first see the sun, and then reason about it. And when he remembered his old habitation and what was the wisdom of the cave and his fellow prisoners, do you not suppose that he would bless himself for the change? Did he then? honors among themselves on those who were the quickest to observe the passing shadows and to remark 
which of them went before and which followed after and which were together and who were therefore best able to draw conclusions as to the future. Do you think that he would care for such honors and glories or envy the possessors of them? Would he not say with Homer, better to be the poor servant of a poor master and to endure anything rather than think as they do and live after their manner. Imagine once more such a one coming suddenly out of the sun to be replaced in his old situation. Would he not be certain to have his eyes full of darkness? And if there were a contest of measuring the shadows and he had to compete with the prisoners who had never moved out of the den, while his sight was still weak, and before his eyes had become steady, wouldn't they all laugh at him and say he had spoiled his eyesight by going up there? And that it was better not to even think of the same? And if anyone tried to release another and lead him out to the light, let them only catch the offender and they would put him to death. It is the task of the enlightened not only to ascend to learning and to see the good, but to be willing to descend again to those prisoners and to share their troubles and their honors, whether they are worth having or not. And this they must do, even with the prospect of death. They should give of their help to one another wherever each class is able to help the community. Well, thank you, Dick and Larry, for that wonderful little introduction to the forms by way of the allegory of the cave. Uh, anyone been exposed to this allegory already? Usually I have a couple students who have. It's a famous one, one that has been given more interpretations than there are words in the allegory itself. So we'll just take a look at one possible interpretation of it, and a rather straightforward one, in order to introduce the topic at hand. So what's going on here? Well, let's start from the beginning. I don't have a discussion sheet on this specifically for you, but it, if you can just maybe jot down this stuff in the back of the sheet you have, because it's possible that it could be on the final, I'm not sure yet. So we begin in the cave itself. What does this signify? Well, it's what we are born into. We are these prisoners chained in the cave, of course. And I suppose I'll try one more time turning this projector off. Nope. But it's not the world as it has to be. It is the world as it immediately appears to the senses represents the world as it appears to the senses. It's all we know, so we of course think it quite real, but along with this comes all the lower desires that automatically force themselves upon us. obsession with shadows dancing in the wall of the cave is Plato's allegory for the obsession with pleasures and money and things like that. Along with all the lower desires for pleasures, etc., that it foists upon us. You could have all that down, or you could just have down that it represents 
the entire sensible world. It might be a little easier to write down. The whole sensible world is the cave. So the prisoners in the cave, well, sure, it's everybody, but obviously, as the allegory itself says, some people leave the cave. Therefore, those who remain prisoners are those who do not leave the what life? The philosophic life, the examined life. The prisoners are those who do not live the examined life. This is not some elitist allegory. Anybody can choose to leave the cave. It is not reserved for some special group that is only given uh, entry into by some sort of a hierarchy. Those who do not live the examined life. In other words, those who don't bother to ask the questions that really matter. And we must be blunt. Is this the few or the many? The many. At least, that is certainly what Plato is telling us with this allegory. OK, I'm going to simplify the allegory a bit for the sake of time and because we don't need to go into all of the nitty gritty of it. We've got puppets, we've got shadows, we've got the fire, we've got the raised way. All of those things, let's kind of compile together instead of picking apart each detail. Let's just look at the shadows and the puppets. Those are the things we see. Well, we see the shadows specifically. The shadows are two levels removed from ultimate reality. The puppets are one level removed. But let's just say that both of these are mere imitations or copies of ultimate reality. If we wanted to go into more detail on this, I would bring up Plato's divided line, where we move from opinion to belief to knowledge. So it's not just from false to true. There's more stages. But let's just simplify it for our sake here. The shadows and the puppets are clearly neither ultimate reality. Ultimate reality is where? Outside of the cave. It is beyond, in other words, the realm of the mere senses. So we go outside the objects. We are, when we are released from prison, we can finally go outside of the cave, and we can see the objects outside. These are what? The forms. What on earth is that? We'll get to it soon. The sun is particularly, of all of the objects outside, the sun has special importance. Because the sun, it is only thanks to the sun that we can see all of these objects outside. So although the sun is a real thing outside, it has an exalted position because it is by virtue of it that we see all other real things. This is the form of forms. It is the ultimate form. It is the form that gives all other forms its being. The form of the good. More on that in a minute. All right, there's more to this, uh, to this allegory, but let me just give two more points here that are noteworthy for our sake. It's very significant in this allegory, the re-entry into the cave, re-entering the cave. What is that? that is benefiting society with philosophic discovery, probably in politics. Benefiting society I prefer to say discovery instead of enlightenment just because certain connotations come with the word enlightenment today like some sort of elitist thing, but it's just a matter of discovering things. Sufficient philosophical uh, exertion will hopefully lead you to discover truths, and the key is to simply share the benefit of those truths with society. But you re-enter the cave, maybe they'll kill you, as it was implied in that allegory, as they did to Socrates, 
And even if they are willing to confer any honors, you couldn't care less about them. You couldn't care less about getting a wreath on your head for being able to predict what a shadow on a wall is going to do next. The honors conferred by prisoners in a cave, all of that worldly stuff that the genuine philosopher couldn't care less about. Worldly recognition, money, etc. Okay. But what really is all of this about? This is all about the distinction between two types of reality. Real reality and imitative reality. Objects and shadows. Truth and mere opinion. Truth and actually illusion. So, Let's go back to our School of Athens image. I talked about my little red circle there a little bit. And those who know things about art, which I really don't, but I know enough to know that there's something called the infinity point, which is what? Maybe I'm wrong, but I've been told that the infinity point is what the parallel lines in the image lead your eyes up to. And artists take advantage of this in order to emphasize what is most important about the painting. The infinity point is uh, called that because, well, parallel lines don't actually intersect. Obviously, that's why they're called parallel. But they seem to, at some indeterminate point out of the horizon. And the main parallel lines here on the floor lead your eyes up to what? The hands. The key distinction in this whole painting is found in the hands. And whose hands are they, first of all? Who do you suppose these guys are? One of them is the man of the moment, Plato. There's Plato pointing up. And who's next to him going like this? Aristotle. Remember, Aristotle is one of Plato's students. So, uh, so he's rightfully so depicted as younger here. Um, that being said, this painting is not intended to be historically accurate. It is not portraying one point in time. There are thousands of years of thinkers in this one scene here. I don't know all of them, but I know a couple. Um, let's see. Well, first of all, Socrates is in here. But he's not who you might at first think it is. He's not one of the guys in the center. We usually people assume that Socrates would be right in the center. He's close to the center. Did someone say orange? I heard orange. I heard, did you say gray? Oh, wow. This one? Oh, very close. He's right there. Yeah, exactly. It's as if someone took a picture here and said cheese, and Socrates isn't even paying attention. He's just completely focused. Not talking. Yeah, he's completely and utterly focused on the person he's talking to. It's like he doesn't even know someone's painting his picture. Well, that's very, uh, that's very Socrates. But also, he's wearing just basically rags. I mean, which is also correct, because he was dirt poor. He's wearing just the most basic brown garment. Um, he's completely fixated upon this dialogue he's having with a couple of people, one of whom doesn't look very interested at all, one of them maybe is a little angry. This actually, I think, is Alexander the Great, Aristotle's student, uh, not a philosopher, but he gets in there anyway. 
Um, let's see, here's where I'm not, I believe this is Heraclitus, who's kind of off in his own world thinking about things, um, lamenting that all is change and nothing is constant. This, I believe, is Pythagoras, figuring out new mathematical truths. This is actually thousands of years later, maybe 1,000 years later. Averroes, I believe this is, an Islamic scholar, a very important Islamic scholar of the Middle Ages. This interesting fellow here, Diogenes, the cynic, otherwise referred to as Diogenes the dog, who was also called a Socrates gone mad. Socrates might appear somewhat mad, but he's quite sane compared to Diogenes, who just went off every extreme you could imagine and uh, didn't have any real solid philosophical insights, but did have an interesting life. Um, anyway, my intent, sorry, my intent is not to go through all of these people, but uh, not that I know all of them anyway. Euclid, doing geometry. Um, I can't remember the other people. Anyway, the point here is that the, the, this whole image hinges upon the distinction between pointing up and going like this. So the hands are saying it all. And the hands are trying to answer the fundamental question. Some have said is the fundamental question of all philosophy. I don't think it's the fundamental question of all philosophy, but it's important. And it's up there. And famously, Plato and Aristotle have different views on it. Now, as you'll see as we go through this discussion, Plato and Aristotle, yes, they have disagreement on this question, but they have far more agreement than they have disagreement. The disagreement tends to be overemphasized, perhaps in part because of paintings like this. This is 500 years old, though. When it was drawn by Raphael, I think in the 1500s, the disagreement would have perhaps seemed more stark than we today realize it in fact is. And again, we'll get to that in a moment. But again, suffice to say that we need to figure out what's going on with these hands here. What are these hands trying to answer? Well, let me put a couple of lists of terms on the board. And this, is, this might appear extremely confusing. Don't worry, you don't need this in your notes. And I'm certainly not going to test you on this. This is just to get the ball rolling mentally. Sorry, I have to do some erasing. I'm going to put on the board three lists of terms. And this is not what you want in your three columns of the table in your discussion sheet. That's different. I'll get to that in a few minutes. But first, I want you to just think as I write these words on the board. Think about what is different about each of these lists of terms and what is similar about the items within each list. All right, so one list. We have chalkboard, desk, cloud, phone, hand, me. OK, second list. We have three, green, double, justice, friendship. Human, oh, I knew I'd do that. Human nature. Love. Beauty. Truth. There's quite a list. Now one more list. List one, chalkboard, desk, cloud, phone, hand, me. 
you could put the word this in front of each of those, and that would even be more accurate with what I'm getting at there. Second list, three, green, double, justice, friendship, human nature, love, beauty, truth. Third list, square circle, Frodo, Frodo Baggins, iPhone nature, Cyclops, random letters and numbers, random scribbling, and eight trillion years ago. What is going on with these three lists of terms? Yes. Exactly. Physical objects. In other words, we could call them concrete particulars. Okay. Okay. And then the last one's kind of like mid slim. It's like not really. I know that we made up. Issues. Certainly, there's certainly issues with these. Yeah. But the issues are very different from one thing to another. So, like, this has way more issues than this, for example, but they both what? Sorry, that is. Is it the same amount of like abstraction separation? That's key. The, the amount of abstraction we're speaking about here—that is definitely key. And I'm at, uh, this is kind of a trick question because how you even answer what the difference is between these lists is exactly what Plato is trying to get at with his theory of forms, his most important theory. And how exactly one answers what is different about these lists answers, or, or I should say, gives what your own theory is in response to the very same question Plato was trying to answer. Of all the various things we could say about this list, these lists, for one thing I think is fairly obvious, these are, these are physical objects, concrete particulars. These are things, in other words, that are accessible to the senses. You can kick any one of these things. Please don't kick some of them. but. It would be possible, at least. What's that? Uh, yeah, that would be difficult, unless you're a mountain climber. These things on the list on the extreme right here do not refer to anything real. Some of them are, are intrinsically contradictory, like square circle. They're, that's an intrinsic contradiction. Some of them are simply fictional, like Frodo. Some of them are absurd, like iPhone nature. Um, we're we're, we're going to get to these things in a moment, but clearly there's no such thing as an iPhone nature. Why? Because an iPhone is whatever Apple wants it to be. If Apple wants their next generation of iPhones to be just chalkboards, that's what they'll be. They own that trademark. It's just a name that they put on whatever they want to invent next. They can do whatever they want with that name. There is no fundamental intrinsic iPhone nature. It's just an iPhone a name slapped on whatever they want it to be. Cyclops, fictional. This. I'm sure if you Googled it, something would come up. But my point is, this is supposed to be just random. This is just a scribble 8 trillion years ago. It doesn't refer to anything real, because that was before the dawn of time. So although these are all different, all these, although these each have different issues with them, they all refer to something that is not real. How exactly to deal with fictional references is a whole philosophy of its own that um, I'd rather not dive too deeply into right now. But somewhat interesting. The real question is these things here. There's obviously such a thing as three. There's obviously such a thing as all of these things. But what are we referring to by the various things in the middle there? Are we referring to mere fiction, mere invention? Or are we referring to something even realer than real itself, even realer than concrete particulars themselves? That's the ultimate question. The ultimate question, in other words, is where is my notes? There is my notes. The ultimate question, the question Plato is seeking to answer with this theory of forms, what are those things that we speak of but cannot touch? What are they? And what does their being consist? An 
I shouldn't say cannot touch, because that's just one sense. I mean cannot sense at all. And I don't even mean that. I just mean don't have concrete existences at all. Even if, so I really should speak more generally. I should say, what are those things that we speak of but cannot, um, well, I will stick with but cannot touch, but just understand that I mean that much more broadly. I mean, what are those things that we speak of but aren't physical at all? What are they? There's a couple other ways of putting the same question. What are natures slash universals? Another way of putting the same question, you don't need this in your notes, but it has been, the same question has been phrased this way. How can the same thing be in multiple places at once? For example, here's, that's three. Um, there's three and there's three. Those are all equally, truly, absolutely three. So how on earth does three exist here, here, and here? That's a weird way of putting it, but it has been said that way. How can the same thing, how is this desk, how is this desk, so on and so forth. How am I human, how are you human, how do we mean human? How do we say the same, how does the same thing, humanness, exist in different places at the same time? You can put a dash ness after anything also, after, natures, if you put like ness after anything, sounds kind of weird, so you can even do it after your name. What is the ness of anything is asking what is the nature of that thing? What is it? All right. There's three fundamental categories of answers to these questions. Let's run through each of them. A little more racing. There are certainly more than three answers to this question, but I think the easiest way to categorize the three types of answers is as follows. I put the heading down already on your sheet. We've got the topic at hand, the discussion sheet at hand, namely Plato's forms. That's one answer. We have Aristotelian hylomorphism. It's another answer. And we have nominalism. That's a third answer. First of all, Plato. Plato says, all of those things that I put there in the first list, a particular object, a particular objects, concrete particulars, things you can kick, he says those are the, basically the things that we are born into this world being obsessed with. The mundane, the things that we can touch and see. But those are really not even ultimate reality itself. They are mere shadows. All of the things that we can see, Plato says, are mere shadows, mere copies, mere imitations of the corresponding reality of each. That is a form that exists somewhere as a literal substance in a literal realm of the forms that is not within this realm, that is not within this dimension, you could almost say. It's certainly not within this cosmos, at least. It is detached from this world and yet exists truly and literally, even more literally than this podium right here exists. The forms exist and every single thing that we see is a projection of its corresponding form. The forms are eternal, perfect, and changeless. Everything that we speak of has a form in this realm of the forms. The goal of the philosopher, the goal of enlightenment, is to rise above obsession and attachment to the realm of concrete particulars. And to rise above that and to instead dwell intellectually, philosophically, abstractly in the contemplation of the forms. Now that might seem a little out there. And I'll uh, sympathize with you if that's how you feel. But, but stay tuned because 
There might just be something that makes a little more sense coming in a minute. But let's get down to something about that. The forms, the question then, by the way, if we relate it to what I had on the board before, is what are the things in the second list? All those, everything from three and green and double all the way to love and goodness and friendship and everything in between. All of those things are realities that we speak of but cannot touch. What are they? Plato says they are the forms. They are ultimate reality. In a minute, I'll just do a hard, um, a hardware reset of that projector. But I want to talk about the hands a little more before I do that. They literally exist. I'm going to use the word literal a lot here because I mean it. I do not use the word literal flippantly, actually meaning figuratively. I mean literally. They literally exist as literal substances in a literal realm of the forms. Many add a heavenly realm of the forms because it's almost like, again, it's almost like this heavenly place. Every single thing that exists, again, has its corresponding reality in that realm. If there are horses, it's because there is hoarseness itself in this realm of the forms. Whenever the definite article is placed in front of something as opposed to the indefinite article A, it is a reference to the corresponding platonic form of the thing. If I, if I say, so if I say, Chris, you are the man, versus if I say, Chris, you are a man, which is a bigger compliment. The man, because it's like saying you are the platonic form of manness itself. So there's this, there's this idea of masculinity, manness. Well, Plato would say that is because there is a corresponding form. There is, mas there is manness itself in this realm of the form. There is, you, you have this idea, you see an individual horse and you think it is a beautiful thing, but you can conceive of a more perfect and beautiful horse still. That thing that's in your mind is hoarseness itself, and it exists only in the realm of the forms. And all individual horses are shadows or copies or imitations of that ultimate horse that exists in the heavenly realm of the forms, along with all the other ultimate existent, ultimate realities. Um, these things are the goal of the philosopher. The forms are the goal of the philosopher. I believe it's in the dialogue Phaedrus where Socrates talks about how the forms, they are the goal, they are the goals of the philosopher, and they are also the food of the gods. The gods dwell in, in a certain sphere of the cosmos and they go in their chariots out to the outer spheres and they feast on the forms themselves. And before we were all born imprisoned in human bodies, as Socrates would say, we too were feasting in the forms in this heavenly chariot realm of the gods. Very interesting uh, story he goes through there. But anyway, as you can see, it makes sense that Raphael depicted Plato pointing up, doesn't it? Because by pointing up, he's saying what? They're up there. The, que the answer to the question, what are the things we speak of but cannot touch? Plato tells us right here with his hand. They're up there. They are in the realm of the forms. They are not here. But what does Aristotle say? Aristotle's hand is like this. Aristotle answering the same question, what are those things we speak of but cannot touch, does not say they are elsewhere. He says they're here. But he also doesn't dismiss the question. He also doesn't say there's no such thing. That's what the nominalist does. So let's first, before we talk about Aristotle's view, let's take a look at the extreme opposite view. Let me, let me just force this thing off now so that you guys can see the board a little easier. Oh, can I reach that? <laughs> I thought I could reach this. 
Maybe my shoes are smaller today or something. Do you want to give it a try? Oh, are you sorry? Yeah, you, it's just that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Ah, now you guys can see a little easier. Maybe that's in a different classroom that I could reach the button. Okay, so if, so if this is a little extreme, don't worry, you're not the only one to think that. But uh, we can also pretty easily ascertain the extreme opposite. So if Plato's answer to the question is that the forms are ultimate reality itself. They are the goal of our life. They exist literally elsewhere. We must strive to return to that perfect realm of the existence of the forms. What's the extreme opposite of Plato's view? There are no forms at all. They are mere names. The forms are mere names that we invent and artificially foist upon reality to try and force it to have meaning when in fact it has no meaning. So a nominalist, in other words, says that all there are, all the only thing that exists is concrete particulars. Anything is either a concrete particular or it is a mere name. You can see why this is called nominalism. It's just really a variation of the word nameism. Nameism is not a word, but you could call this philosophy nameism. It says that all of those things are mere names. They're perhaps social constructs, whatever you want to call them, they're names that don't refer to any actually existing reality. Now, nominalism didn't exist as a specific philosophy in Plato's day. In fact, it came from the most unlikely of suspects. A thousand and a half years after Plato, from a medieval monk by the name of William of Ockham, who is famous above all for nominalism and Ockham's razor. Now, he didn't realize, he, he just formed the very seed of nominalism. He didn't realize it would become everything that it has become today. But let's consider what nominalism implies. All of those things in that second list, they're mere non-existent names, constructs. Almost every major philosophical, frankly I must say, error that we've addressed so far in this class is a specific brand of nominalism. The very first one, relativism, is truth nominalism. There isn't a truth, it is mere opinion. Um, Callicles and his idea on the good life. Well, that would be moral nominalism. Although he's not strictly a nominalist because he says there is a right and a wrong and the right is wrong. But really, it's just another way of saying there isn't a true right. It's mere convention. Nominalism seeks to reduce all of the greatest realities to some sort of a social construct or name or fabrication. Um, beauty nominalism. That's the most popular today, perhaps, sub subjectivism. There's a certain quote that's very popular about beauty, and it is a very nominalist quote. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Now, as, as, with, as with most cliche statements like that, you could mean something perfectly good. If by beauty is in the eye of the beholder, you mean the real beauty is inner, and it takes someone who understands that and appreciates it in a person to really see it. That's what I think what most people mean when they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And I agree fully with that. But in and of itself, beauty is in the eye of the beholder is, is uh, nominalism with respect to beauty. So that beauty doesn't exist, it's mere fad. Um, the, uh, there is no human nature, according to the nominalists. We are all, there are, we are 10 radically isolated individual heaps of uh, flesh in this room, and there is no such thing as human nature that we share. There is no principle of unity 
that differentiates a thing with order versus a pile of garbage. The principle of unity of anything derives from its form. But if, it, if its form doesn't exist, if forms are just names, then there are no principles of unity. It's a key concept in philosophy, the different types of principles of unity. For example, if you look at all this stuff in a garbage can, there's nothing in this garbage can right now, so I can't really use it as an example. You call it one pile of garbage by virtue of what? From what does it derive its oneness? What's that? Sorry. Yeah, it's just in the same what? Yeah, it's just in the same spot. There's nothing, there's no necessary underlying nature to the things in a garbage can. It's just a bunch of stuff in the same spot. Well, this has a somewhat greater principle of unity. It has a, a design, a blueprint that underlies it. But then we could go up to a greater principle of unity still and refer to a living being. More on that in the, when we get to the Thedo discussion. But anyway, nominalism says there are no substantial principles of unity. Everything is a heap. There, uh, so there isn't a human nature. There isn't any nature. All natures are also just other names that we invent and foist upon things. OK, so clearly this is more popular today than Plato's forms. But Aristotle, as usual, comes to the rescue with, with his happy medium. Aristotle says this. First of all, we have to understand he agrees with Plato. It's very popular to point out the contrast between Aristotle and Plato, as indeed the School of Athens painted by Raphael does. But that obscures the fact that Aristotle is way closer to Plato than he is to nominalism. If you had like Plato's forms here and nominalism here, Aristotle would be somewhere around here. Yeah, he disagrees with Plato on a couple points, and I'll say in a moment what those are. But he actually presents himself as a proponent, meaning a believer in Plato's theory of forms. He says that in his own words. All right. So Plato, Aristotle says, is right that the forms exist. He says he's right that they are the real essence of a thing. That the that the isness of a thing is due to its essence, is due to its form, not merely to its matter. But Aristotle says they are not literal substances that exist elsewhere. He says the forms are real. And by the way, you can't even necessarily refer to the forms because each type of form is so different. It's kind of absurd to list three in green and love and beauty in the same list even. And Aristotle realized that. He came up with his famous 10 categories. He says all being is one of 10 things. And he lists those 10 things. Anyway, uh, I don't know if we'll get a chance to go into those part, that part of his metaphysics. But suffice it to say that he answers the question, that why is Plato lumping all these things together as just forms? Aristotle does address that. Anyway, Aristotle says the forms are real but not as literal substances elsewhere. He says, rather they exist Mysteriously, he doesn't say mysteriously, but I'm going to put that, put that in there because, frankly, Aristotle doesn't fully figure it out. So there is mystery here still. They exist mysteriously within the very particulars, the very concrete particulars, I should say. That exhibit them. In other words, for example, he says, there is a human nature. It is not a mere name. We are humans. There is such a thing as a human nature, our general form. We also have individual forms, our souls. We'll get to that in Phaedo. But if you want to learn about a form, you don't simply abstractly contemplate it. If you want to learn about human nature, as Aristotle says with his hand here, basically, you study what? Humans, yeah. Pretty straightforward. Aristotle was obsessed 
with studying the world scientifically, but not restricting himself to merely empirical conclusions. He was one of the greatest scientists who ever lived. Uh, he wrote, the, the majority, the, Aristotle wrote more about biology than anything else. But he was not afraid of, go, of leaping beyond merely empirical conclusions that you can directly observe with a microscope. He was not afraid of leaping beyond the data to universal conclusions, to philosophical conclusions. Um, I believe it was Bertrand Russell, who was actually a secular philosopher in the 1800s. He, 1900s as well, when his life spanned those centuries, he called Charles Darwin a schoolboy compared to Aristotle, simply in biology. Um, Aristotle was a genius of a scientist. He realized that these observations we make about the physical world, they must not be discarded, as Plato would sometimes be tempted to do, thinking this is all just shadows in the wall of a cave. No. The forms are real. We, yes, they are the goal of the philosopher, but we learn about them by abstra intellectually abstracting universal truths from our concrete experience. He's not, this is getting kind of abstract, but he's not an empiricist. An empiricist is a type of, empiricism is a type of philosophy that disdains abstract universal conclusions because they leap beyond the data. Aristotle is all about leaping beyond the data to abstract universal conclusions. But unlike a Platonic idealist, he's saying we must indeed have that data. An idealist sees the data that is achieved through the senses as like dirty, as like unworthy of philosophy. But that is also not true. Aristotle, as always, gives the golden mean. And honestly, he's almost always right when he criticizes Plato. Here's the thing. Plato, I often say, has the wisest errors in history. I believe that. I'm afraid he's not right that there's literal, that, this, uh, that there are, the forms are literal substances in a literal realm that's literally somewhere spatially detached from here. And yet, although he's kind of an error on that and Aristotle's criticism is probably correct, Plato gives us the antidote to nominalism is a far greater danger than just about anything else in uh, relation to this discussion, at least. Nominalism contains within itself so many other errors. Nominalism rejects as unreal the very things we all know we must dedicate our lives to and live for the sake of. So Aristotle is the genius. Plato is the wise man. Socrates, the hero, the father. And they all have their special role to fulfill. And with each of these three, we see philosophy itself introduced the best possible way. And uh, that's not just me saying that. The, a lot of the best philosophers out there agree that the best way to introduce philosophy is to look at ancient Greek philosophy. Anyway, let's fill this out. A couple more things I want you to have down on this sheet. Um, you might be wondering what on earth this word hylomorphism is. Well, Aristotle says all being consists of both matter and form. The matter is that out of which it comes to be, and the form is what it is. Highly, this comes from the Greek word for wood, morph, form, and this is an example of fashioning an item out of wood. Well, if this were actually wood, that would be nice. Pretend it is. I could point to this and say, what is it? And you could say wood, but a better answer to that question would be desk. We have a tendency today to suppose that the matter of a thing is what it is in its essence, but that's not true. The matter of a thing is that out of which it comes to be. It is the raw material. It is that which precedes the existence of the thing in question. So if I point to that thing right there under my desk here and I say, what is that? Well, you could say it's a hunk of silicon and, and, and copper and plastic, but a much better answer to that would be computer. The silicon, the plastic, and the copper pre-existed the computer, and they were carefully put together in accordance with a given overarching structure, namely a form. And once it finally acquired that form, it came into being as a computer. And the computer is what it is. 
Now that's a relatively low type of form because it's, it's, uh, it doesn't have the same type of principle of unity and being as a living thing. More on that in the next unit or in the next discussion. But it's still a form nevertheless. So let's have down a brief summary of that. Aristotle says that being, anything that exists in other words, consists in both matter and form. And the form is its essence. So it's real, it's there, but it's not a material or quasi-material existence. It is rather the essence of a thing. So these forms are here, but they exist within us. Goodness, truth, beauty, love, friendship, justice, all of those things Aristotle says are real. But it's almost more hopeful. It's, Aristotle's not saying you have to be this completely detached, abstract, idealist philosopher like Plato to arrive at the contemplation and appreciation and understanding of these things. He's saying you learn about these things by learning about the concrete particulars that exhibit them. You learn again about human nature by knowing human beings. You learn about all of the forms by exposing yourself to the real situations in which they are displayed. And yes, you will rise above those individual situations and come to universal conclusions that transcend individual situations, but you can't pretend to skip the individual situations and arrive directly at those universal conclusions that come by way of the common sense experience. As we said in the beginning of the course, that common sense experience is necessary. There's no dispensing of it. All right, so I want to talk quickly about Plato's simile of the sun. Um, all you need down, just, just, just write that word down at least, the simile of the sun. This is one of his most important similes, analogies. Because this, if you want to be a full-blown Platonist, this might be kind of your way to do so. Um, Plato's, remember as we were watching the video on the allegory, Yes, the objects outside of the cave are real. But if we're talking at least about sight, if we're just, no analogy is perfect, so just restrict your consideration to the sense of sight right now. Whenever you see anything outside during the day, you really are seeing what? The sun. Yeah, you're seeing the light bouncing off of them, which is simply the sun. Whenever you see anything outside, you're really seeing the sun. Um, that's most obvious if you just have a mirror. You look at the mirror and you see the sun, but everything is just a mirror in its own way. Um, similarly, just to, but it's not even just sight. You know, with, we, we could, I've done this before, I think, with a different, uh, in a different topic, but we can take anything that distinguishes the face of this planet from a completely formless wasteland is thanks only to the sun. All energy, all movement, all life in the face of the planet is only thanks to the sun. To this day, our technology hasn't really changed that much. And again, no analogy is perfect, so there are some exceptions. But this light itself is only from the sun. Why? Well, there's electricity going through these lines. And the only reason the electricity is going through these lines is because there's a generator some miles away turning it 60 times every second. The only reason that's happening is because there is a turbine turning at the same rate. The only reason that turbine is changing is because there's steam shooting through it, which is hooked up to a boiler, which is boiling. Why? Because natural gas is firing it. But where did the energy in that natural gas come from? Well, from underground, from decaying plant matter from a long time ago. And where did that plant matter get its energy? The sun. You can follow any movement, any energy, anything whatsoever of meaning on the whole face of the planet back far enough and you'll always get to the sun. Plato chose his analogy wisely because he says that the sun, just as the sun 
gives life and movement and energy to all things, even in the face of the whole planet, so too, in the realm of the forms, there is one form, absolute and supreme above all, that gives its own being, that is, that is exuding being and enabling the very existence of all the other forms. And then the forms in existence are enabling the being of all of the various um, imitations of them that we see in the sensible world. But everything can be traced back to this sun, which is the analogy for the form of forms as you put down when we were talking about the allegory, the form of the good. The good is the ultimate form for Plato. Everything else only has any being because it participates somehow in the good. So the real goal of the philosopher, the real goal of everyone, the real goal of everything, is to arrive at its ultimate destiny, namely the good itself. So as you can probably see, this isn't a very difficult philosophy to slightly alter to make it correlate much better with some later philosophies. Neoplatonism was big, neo meaning new, obviously. Well, Neoplatonism is new Platonism, meaning it's about 1,700 years old, this uh, new. And uh, there was a revival of Plato seven, several hundred years after his time. One of the biggest names in this was Augustine, philosopher, theologian, and saint. He was a Platonist. He, he only had one modification to Plato's theory to make it work with his own, own views. And what do you suppose that was? The form of the good is just God. And all of the forms, Augustine says, okay, they're not literal substances in a literal place, but all the forms are ideas in the mind of God. So he, he slightly modifies Plato's theory to make it uh, work with a more common view, certainly the Christian view. Um, but that's certainly not the only Christian view. There, you know, Aquinas was also a saint, that a philosopher who came well after Augustine, and he was much more Aristotelian. So, the uh, you know, religious views don't necessarily settle philosophical ones. There, there's there are separate discussions. So, there is a simile of the sun. And I'm just going to check here and make sure that I didn't miss giving you anything else that you'll need for the final. Oh, I have here a note that you don't need this down, but a nominalist, of course, would say that all, we talked about this in the pre-Socratics unit, Pythagoras was very much not a nominalist with numbers, but uh, if you, those, a quote like, Anomalous would say, for example, all numbers are imaginary numbers. There's no difference between I and three. They're both just as, one is just as imaginary as the other. 